Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the January 5th COVID-19 virtual news conference. My name is Christine Messenger, and I'm a public information officer here at the COVID-19 Joint Information Center. Today, we're joined by Humboldt County Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Director Michelle Stevens and County Health Officer Dr. Ian Hoffman. Assistant Director Stevens, can you provide us with an update? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Hi there, happy new year. Um, so in the first two days of this week, the JIT call center staff have answered 316 calls. Uh, 58,650 calls have been answered since the call center opened in the beginning of the pandemic. And at its height, the JIC had dozens of staff uh, that were working in the, in the Joint Information Center, and we're now down to a, hand, a handful, all of whom have other jobs within DHHS that they're responsible for. Uh, and this is our first news conference of the year. Uh, we plan to host news conferences every week going, every other week going forward. Uh, but we'll continue the daily reporting except on days that the county is closed. Thanks. Thank you. And Dr. Hoffman, can you please provide us with an update? Sure. Thanks, Michelle, for being here. It feels like old times. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start off with the Omicron update. Um, you know, I think that it's it's safe to say, based on the recent uh, genomic sequencing from a few weeks ago, that Omicron is here and it's circulating in our community, and we are really starting to see the beginnings of the Omicron surge in Humboldt County. Um, we, you know, want to offer a message of caution and hope in in this. Uh, upcoming surge, I, I think that the caution is really, let's let's all get prepared. We have the tools necessary. We, we've had them all along and they're the same tools for uh, Omicron as they are for every other surge we've been through in this uh, uh, pandemic. So um, vaccination, testing, uh, you know, trying to avoid large gatherings, being in places that are well ventilated, increasing ventilation, um, uh, and the use of isolation and quarantine, which we're going to talk about a little bit more as well. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing in, uh, in, in other places and we're starting to see here are really the, the hallmarks of the Omicron surge, which is, um, you know, starting to see really sharp increases in cases over the last week, um, a small bump in hospitalizations. Uh, and uh, extreme staffing shortages. And I, that's really, I think, where the focus um, for a lot of places has been is that um, because this is spreading so dramatically and so quickly through communities, um, it makes it hard for everywhere to stay open. So not just hospitals and healthcare clinics, but schools and businesses and government. Um, so the more we can take caution with um, you know, all those tools, masking, um, you know, trying to avoid gatherings um, and getting vaccinated, we're going to blunt this surge and, and hopefully have less impact. Um, as far as the uh, impact of this on, on the hospitals, I think, again, it's mostly going to be the staffing uh, and that, you know, that's based on what we've seen in other places. Um, we're seeing less of a severe hospitalizations, the hospitalizations are certainly up in many, many places and, and they are seeing increases in number of beds taken up by COVID infections, um, but they don't seem to be as severe and, and, and much less ICU uh, um, patients with, with COVID. Not to say that they don't exist, but there certainly seem to be quite a bit less than, than previously with the other variants. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that the um, severity of this will continue that way for Humboldt County, um, but we do need to prepare for impacts to the hospital and impacts to businesses and impacts to um, schools and government uh, offices. So um, as far as some of the ways we're preparing here at Public Health for that, uh, we're increasing testing. Um, so we're trying to get more testing in the county. Um, we've increased the optum capacity this, this past week. We're looking to increase it more in the coming weeks. Um, those requests are into the state. Um, we've pushed out um, 15,000 over-the-counter tests throughout different partners, mostly through our school systems. 
um, to test kids as they come back to school this week. Um, and we will continue to try to increase testing for the best of our ability. I do want to say, though, that many, many jurisdictions who are living through this right now, even with all the preparations, have not had enough testing. So testing is likely to be limited, even with all these preparations, um, because of the size of the surge and the speed with which this, this variant spreads. Um, so the most you can do now to try to prepare for increasing your testing um, would, would be beneficial. Um, the last thing you know, I'll say, masking um, is certainly has always been important throughout this entire pandemic, continues to be extremely important. Um, we are encouraging to consider increasing your mask uh, you know, usage and increase your mask quality. Um, and some of that um, is also covered in the ice, new isolation and quarantine orders that have come from CDC and CDPH. Um, so, you know, if you're unvaccinated in this surge, um, you certainly are at higher risk. Um, there are many things you can do to reduce that risk, like wearing a mask, avoiding crowds and gatherings, um, you know, trying to choose uh, outdoor activities uh, whenever possible or increasing ventilation. Um, and certainly getting vaccinated would, would still help um, and, and vaccination is still the best tool that we have against Omicron as it is against all the other variants. Um, the last thing I wanted to let everyone know about is that we will be releasing new isolation and quarantine orders today to line up with um, all of the changing orders that are coming down from the federal agencies and through CDPH. Um, this new order will allow us to essentially implement any of those changes immediately in the future. So there's less lag time between when changes happen at the agencies where they make these um, and Humboldt County. So we should be having that come out um, within the next few hours uh, and look forward to answering questions and um, any discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll take some questions from reporters. Kim Ware? Sorry, my unmute is not cooperating. Um, I was going to ask you about testing, so you caught me off on that one. Um, you've been, uh, Dr. Huffman, you've been discussing um, ways to try and get a get an idea of um, monitoring for Omicron, and you're hoping to have that done this week. To get a better idea, do you, can you talk a little bit about how how the county can do that, how public health can do that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so we've been looking for ways since um, Omicron was first identified. How could we uh, identify it here in the county? Um, you know, as quickly as possible. So um, you know, tests come in from all sorts of different places. They're they're coming to us here at the county, they're going to the state lab, the Lincea branch lab, uh, the CDP. Testing going on in many, many places at home and clinics and hospitals. So there's a lot of testing going on in all the places. So we don't get everything. Um, the, the sequencing that came in earlier this week came or that came in earlier this week from two weeks ago was run through a local pharmacy and they've been partnering with federal uh, sequencing partners to try to get more sequencing of those uh, tests that come through pharmacies. So that's how we got alerted to the first Omicron sequencing. Um, our lo local lab had been doing sequencing, but we have not, that's been on hold for almost two months due to staffing issues um, and just the inability to keep up that platform. So we haven't had that local capacity. What we're trying to get is uh, uh, a test that will find the hallmarks of Omicron. Um, it's called the S gene dropout. So the, the, some, a few previous versions of the variant, uh, previous variants of of um, COVID-19 also had these hallmarks, um, but we haven't seen it for quite a while. 
So we know now when we see that, that it's highly likely that that's Omicron. So it's not a whole genome sequencing, but it's looking for kind of the thumbprint of Omicron. So we're hopeful that sometime before the end of the week, we can run that on some samples and get a sense of what the proportion is. Um, we assume if they have that as gene dropout that they're Omicron, if they don't, they're probably Delta because we just haven't seen anything else for quite a while. Um, so that's what we're looking to do. It's those, you know, again, hampered by staffing, the, the, the um, materials that we needed to run that were in short supply because the whole world is scrambling to get that test up and running at the same time. Um, so we will see. We'll, when we have that data, we'll report it out to you. Um, I also suspect we will continue to get more genomic sequencing in from other partners from both the, the federal um, partnership with the pharmacies and some from the state lab. And then eventually when our staffing's back up, we will be able to run whole genome sequencing here locally again. Kim, do you have a follow-up? Oh, no, that's good, thank you. Thank you. Ryan, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so a question from one of our readers recently expressed some frustration um, that the county dashboard does not reflect current COVID-19 hospitalizations. And I know we've, we've mentioned this and gone over this in the past, but not, not since the beginning of the winter or so, I think. So, um, and I realize that providing that number is possibly you know, somewhat at the discretion of the hospital administrators and um, that it would also include people who tested positive at arrival, not necessarily that they came for COVID care, but then tested anyway, um, just as a matter of procedure there. So while that information can be found at the state website on the dashboard there, locals wanna see it provided at, the, at their fingertips here at our local dashboard. So um, in regard to improving the public's awareness about that um, hospital capacity, and because it's also related to the masking, um, you know, dropping the masking order, um, would it be reconsidered to, to add that onto the dashboard, Dr. Hoffman? And if you could speak to that concern and why, you know, why or why not um, the hospitalization rates currently are not reflected on the dashboard. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I'll talk so a little on the history of that. You know, when we decided to to take that off the dashboard, we were um, in a much different place. Um, it it was the end of um, really the alpha surge. It, it it seemed like we were on the precipice of of this going away, and um, it didn't seem as relevant anymore. So we did take it down. Um, we have continued to use it internally, and those are numbers that get shared internally every day. Um, they also live on other dashboards. So um, if you go to the CDC data tracker, that number is also on there. Um, it's also on the CDPH's uh, dashboard for COVID when you search under Humboldt County. And those are updated daily on both of those websites. And, um, you know, that would be the number that we would put on our website. I think, you know, again, for staffing reasons and, and all sorts of other reasons, it's been really difficult to get changes to the dashboard up and running quickly. Um, so we've kind of let it stand that those live in other places. Um, you know, whether or not they could be added again is certainly a discussion that's ongoing. And we are looking at revamping the entire dashboard as we've talked about um, and still working on finalizing that to make sure that it has all the necessary pieces um, before it goes live. So, um, it, it, the data is out there. It's it's on other dashboards, um, and I can't say for sure it will be on the new dashboard or not. Um, but it does live in many places. As, and I'll just take that opportunity to point out a difference, though, like you mentioned between those numbers that are reported from, say, CDC and CDPH's dashboard, and what we report on a daily basis as hospitalizations. So um, our daily hospitalization. Uh, report and the daily case count um, are only Humboldt County residents who we are following as public health um, who are hospitalized. Uh, and, um, you know, that number is different than the number of people who are in the hospital with COVID. 
um, because some of those patients who are in the hospital are not Humboldt County residents. Some of our patients that we are following are hospitalized in other counties because they were transferred out. Um, so they don't match up. Um, the, the difference is we are not reporting, we're only reporting people who are COVID positive and in the hospital for a reason related to COVID, not that they're there incidentally for something else. As far as the other numbers, those are all encompassing anyone who's, who's in a bed in a hospital who's COVID positive. The majority of them are there for COVID reasons, but there are some that are not, um, but they still take up resources. And so we have to follow them closely as public health because they're using a bed that is isolation. The, the staffing there has to be, you know, using isolation pr procedures, including a lot of PPE. Um, and it's extra work for everyone to take care of those patients in the hospital, even when they're not there for COVID. Do you have a follow-up, Brian? Yes, I would like to um, do a clarifying follow-up there. So um, currently I'm looking at the, um, the hospitalization dashboard here, and it's showing that in Humboldt County, ICU beds. So Dr. Hoffman, um, am I to understand that those are only people who are specifically in the hospital for COVID care, or are those including everybody who's tested positive in the hospital? Sorry, Ryan, you dropped out there and I missed about half of your question. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so Looking at the dashboard right now in hospitalizations, it says 16 um, positive patients, yeah. four positive in the ICU and six available ICU beds. Um, are those all people who checked in because of COVID then? Yeah, so that, that's the, those are the numbers that would include people who are both in the hospital for COVID so they're COVID positive, they have COVID pneumonia or some other COVID complication and they're hospitalized with that. Um, but it will also include some of those people who are in a bed, isolation bed with, you know, whatever else, their gallbladder problem or, you know, um, their kidney problem, but they're not sick with COVID. They still have to be on isolation because they're a COVID patient. They still take up a COVID isolation bed and they still use PPE and higher staffing ratios because of that COVID. So, um, you know, the proportion of that changes day to day. Most of those patients are COVID positive with a COVID related problem. What we're seeing in Omicron is that that number goes up um, and both of those are going to probably go up um, because more and more people in the hospital will be positive who are just there for other reasons. And that's what you know, we saw in some of these surges. Now we've also seen the number of COVID pneumonias go up in these cases, but um, they have tended to not be as severe as previously. So they're less likely to be in, in the ICU. As far as those four ICU patients, um, I could go back and look, I, I haven't looked today, but my guess would be most of those are COVID um, positive ICU patients who are there for a COVID reason. It's not impossible that someone could be in the ICU with other things and be COVID positive, but most of those ICU patients tend to be there because of a COVID related issue. Perfect, thank you. Christina, do you have a question? Yes. Um, so with so many rapid COVID tests recently going out to the schools, is there a proper way, especially for those that tested positive to dispose of these tests? Oh, great question, Christina. Um, so a negative test is, um, does not need to be disposed of in, in any way, um, uh, any special way. Uh, a positive test um, is considered to be infectious. You know, I think um, there, are, it's, there are instructions in the boxes on how to dispose of those. I think, you know, really just um, trying to make sure that they don't um, get handled by other people in the family, you know, pack, you know, sealing them up well, um, and then following those instructions on the box um, would, would be the best way. Um, and then some of those also came with reporting mechanisms, um, either through the iHealth app, um, if, if you got it, um, 
you know, from a non-school source, but if you're getting it from, from uh, Humboldt County Office of Education or from a school, um, we're encouraging you to use the CDPH reporting mechanism that was um, created so that people could report those uh, and they would go into the, um, they'd be visible to the schools then and to us here public health so that we could track those and um, make sure that your positive test result got, um, got counted in, um, you know, for lots of different reasons if you need proof of a positive test in the future. So those that um, test positive, would you guys go pick them up or you just kind of put them in a bag and throw it out? No, we're, we, we have no mechanism to, to do that. Um, so please just follow the instructions in the, in the box. I mean, these are millions and millions of these test kits across the country. And um, yeah, there's, there's no um, specific way other than the recommended manufacturer's way of disposing of them. Okay, thank you. Isabella, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, at the end of 2020, the county saw 22 deaths and 1,764 confirmed cases. At the end of 2021, the county jumped to 122 deaths with 10,952 cases. And 2022 has started off with nearly 600 cases so far, and as of yesterday, one death. Is this year going to continue this deadly trend? And with DHHS down about 30% of its staff, what tactics are planned to make uh, to help turn around, to help 22 turn out uh, different than last year? Uh, I mean, I, I can speak to some of those figures and maybe Michelle can talk to the DHHS component. Um, you know, yeah, we're hopeful that we're gonna break that trend. I mean, I think the, We've been talking about decoupling the cases, case count from the hospitalization and death count. And I, I think that's what Omicron might do um, is really change that dynamic where um, you, you see um, a big surge in hospitalizations and deaths after a big surge in cases. So um, the proportionality is important though, because the surge is so big in Omicron that you still see a fairly significant surge in hospitalizations. I think really the biggest change though has been that we haven't seen that huge shift towards um, you know, a lot of deaths with it. So people, again, people are not as sick, they're still getting hospitalized. If they get hospitalized, they tend not to go to the ICU as much. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, hopefully that will change. I, I, I think, you know, it's a good time to point out though that, um, you know, we still, we haven't talked about Delta yet today. Delta is still here and, and um, you know, we don't have any evidence to suggest that Omicron is absolutely taken over. So, you know, we should all be operating on the assumption until we have stronger evidence that Omicron is the predominant uh, variant in our county that Delta is still the predominant variant. So again, we're hoping to get some of that data in the next couple of days and share that with the community and give some reassurance that, you know, Delta has maybe been edged out um, but as of yet, we're still seeing hospitalizations, quite a few of them. And um, that number, Ryan just quoted 16, is up from the last few days. It had been down under 10 for about uh, a week or two. So we're, we are seeing, you know, it's hard to say if it's a trend or just a little bump right now. I would just add that, you know, the incident command system or ICS system that we use, as well as the same system law enforcement uses an emergency response um, in an emergency preparedness field, it allows for um, expansion and contraction of, of increasing staffing and decreasing staffing. So when, when the pandemic first started, we had a public health department operation center that was really just staffed by public health staff. We started the joint information center. And then as the pandemic got bigger and the response uh, was, uh, we needed a larger response, the emergency operations center, the EOC started through the sheriff's office. And it was a you know, a joint effort. We had staff pulled from all kinds of different departments and from other uh, fire departments and law enforcement. So um, if that were needed again, we have the ability to scale up if needed and the emergency operations center could be reactivated again um, with the sheriff's office. So 
um, that's what we've been doing. So right now we're, we're back to a DHHS Department Operations Center uh, with, with not just public health staff, but also um, other DHHS branch staff. So uh, that's what we would do. Um, we also called on the state for resources. Um, other counties, if they were in the situation, they might also call on the state for other staffing resources too. So it wouldn't just necessarily be DHHS. We'd probably have to um, start the Emergency Operations Center again and, and partner more closely with the Sheriff's Office and, and other folks around staffing. Great, thank you. And I guess I would just follow that with, you know, as Dr. Hoffman had said, bearing in mind that Delta is still indeed here and Omicron is now here. Um, you know, what is the advice that um, you would advise folks to heed with all this different informa new information coming up from the CDC, obviously an onslaught of misinformation all over Facebook and wherever else. Um, you know, I guess what are just kind of some core points that you'd really want to get across to the community to try and ensure everyone's safety during this time? That's great question, Isabel. I think, you know, the message remains the same. Wear a mask, keep your distance, avoid gatherings if possible, get vaccinated, get boosted, and um, let's, you know, get through the next month or two of this and, and hope that it, you know, has less impact on our, um, our schools, our businesses, our hospitals, um, and the health of our community. I would also add, if you're feeling even remotely sick, stay home, right? I think that's the, that's also a number one thing. If testing, you know, if testing is an option for folks and available, then they should be getting tested as well. Um, if it's not, then I think people should err on the side of caution and stay home if they have even allergy-like symptoms, right? Um, and and uh, I think that would be, it's the same stuff that we've been doing, right? It's the same messages that we've been doing, even when we were sheltering in place. So um, we're not sheltering in place, but we should all use those same um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Austin, do you have a question? I do, yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I kind of want to touch on schools. Last uh, Yesterday, Eureka City Schools issued a statement saying after the holiday, their schools have seen an increase in students and staff testing positive for COVID-19. So my question is twofold. First off, do you have any specific figures on how many positive cases were seen in schools? And then second, should parents be worried about sending their kids in person? Thanks, Austin. I don't have any specific numbers that I can share with you, um, but I will say that you know, just as we've seen in the wider community, um, in the last few days in the schools, we have seen large increases in the number of positive cases. So um, that's to be expected to a certain degree after the holidays. Again, this has a little bit of the thumbprint of Omicron on it. So we're, we're looking into that. Um, but just, you know, um, I think it's, it's going to continue um, and we will likely see even more cases over the coming weeks due to the, the nature of how this new variant spreads throughout the community. Um, as far as being safe in the schools, I, I do, I think that it's still the safest place for kids to be. Everyone's masked. They've worked on ventilation. Many of the schools are doing testing. Um, and, you know, certainly we know the disruptions that virtual learning um, took on kids over the last couple of years. So um, we're, we're not recommending going to virtual classrooms. Uh, it might be a necessity for some districts or some schools because of staffing issues. I think that's really, again, going back to what the hallmark of this surge has been in many other places is that staffing becomes very difficult with so many people out sick at once. So the more we can do to try to slow that down, avoiding gatherings, wearing our mask, getting vaccinated, um, it's gonna blunt this surge and, and have less impact on institutions like our schools. Great, thank you. Um, I have one real quick follow-up and you've kind of already touched on it, but I understand that Humboldt County Public Health has recommend postponing or moving to a virtual platform for non-essential events. And I know you've already talked about how at this point in time, you don't recommend returning to virtual learning considering the toll, but at some point further down the line, do you see the potential for possibly returning to virtual learning? 
you know, here's what I say about use of virtual venues. You know, when it's important to be in person, we still recommend it to be in person. So there are activities that are, you know, you can't do virtually. Healthcare, we can't, some of it we can, but a lot of it we can't. You know, um, industry, make, you know, manufacturing, construction, these are not virtual options. So we have to be in person. And I think what we've learned is that in school instruction is one of those. So it is a last resort to, to move to virtual learning when it's necessary because of other factors. That I think is, is uh, you know, we, not something we have evidence for. Um, and we think that it's, we know that it's safe based on the data and the, all of the things that we've, we've done to take um, precautions. Most people are getting COVID outside of schools, outside of their workplaces, you know, going to gatherings, not wearing a mask, being unvaccinated. So that's where the primary spread is. It's very small in those institutions because they're taking so many precautions. I just wanted to draw a parallel to other essential services like providing behavioral health services, right? I, we, we saw the impact of, of virtual on the community that experiences mental illness or other, other um, emotional, you know, it's been stressful. It's been really hard and we've seen increases in suicide and other, other concerns. And so we, we know that, that providing in-person services for behavioral health, especially, and other, other services is really critical. I would say that we also saw that for a lot of kids doing virtual learning was really, really difficult. Um, and so um, like Dr. Hoffman said, it should be, it should be a last resort. And we weren't seeing, we haven't been seeing as many cases in schools as we have in other sectors, which is pretty phenomenal, really. The schools really do have it dialed when it comes to using those NPIs um, and the testing that they have as an option for parents with, for their kids and catching cases that way and getting kids in isolation and quarantine has been really effective. So we strongly encourage to continue that. Thank you. Lauren, do you have a question? following up on Isabella Vander Heiden's question, you know, it's been reported that the Omicron variant is highly contagious, even more so than the Delta, yet it results in less severe outcomes of the disease. So Dr. Hoffman, do you think the Omicron variant could be like a silver lining in helping to end the pandemic? It's a great question. I think all of us are hopeful and um, would love to see that silver lining come true, but you know, you never know what the silver lining is until you're on the other side. So I think what we know right now, based on everyone else's experience so far, and you know, we do get a little bit of benefit being in humble of having some foreshadowing because um, we tend to, to have these surges come here a little later than other places. So we, we do know that, um, it, it looks to be less severe. Um, there tends to be less um, ICU admissions, uh, so less need for ventilation and less um, you know, severe outcomes and certainly so far less death. Um, there, because of the sheer volume, there has been an increase in many places in hospitalizations of um, more you know, moderate disease, so people with pneumonia who need hospitalization, but not yet needing a ventilator. Um, so I think that's, you know, a cautionary for sure. Um, and then, you know, whether or not this could be sort of the end of the pandemic, um, with a lot of people getting immunity, natural immunity, plus boosting the immunity, the vaccination immunity that's out there. Um, I think while there's some hope again there, uh, I think it's reasonable to also take some caution that we have tried, we've, we've seen that and we've tried to make predictions in the past and failed. So I, I think that, um, you know, no one has a crystal ball and we should all be prepared that there could be another variant out there. Um, but we'll get through this one and it, it certainly 
seems like from a, a, a death and ICU uh, hospitalization, ventilation uh, perspective, it's gonna be much better. Um, the real concern in this surge is, is staffing across the board in all sectors. I think the takeaway One is quick follow up. Um, sorry, I was just going to say, sorry. I think I think what we're, we've said is that Omicron is kind of the good news, bad news variant, really. Right. I think that's what um, Dr. Hoffman's describing. Sorry, Lauren. Lauren, we can't, we can't understand you. Do you want to try again or do you want to type it in the chat and I can read the question? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, quick follow up. So I believe January 15th was the date set to reconsider um, lifting the indoor mask mandate. Um, I'm guessing that's not the case, but can you just share a quick update? Yeah, we're still watching things. Um, certainly from all the metrics that we set, the three metrics, the case count, the hospitalizations and the vaccination rates, we haven't met any of those. So. Um, but we'll we'll still look at it on January 15th and, and let the public know. Um, I'll, also, that's the date that CDPH has set for evaluating um, their statewide mask mandate. And so we'll also be watching to see what the state does. Thank you. Well, thank you guys all for coming. Um, thanks to our panelists and to our media representatives for joining us today. We'll send you links as soon as the recording is ready and have a great day. Happy New Year's, everyone.